I'm Cami Samuels from Verse and Ventures. And the first question I was going to ask you is the studies that you showed almost always involved what sound like five to eight hours of act and then sustained response. And yeah, you know, we're all of friends who've come back from a self help weekend and they they have a behavioral change for a period of time and it needs to be shepherded, to, to be maintained. So I'm curious about how real you think that sustain is. is uh, we, <laughs> we need more data on that. There, with the pain uh, the, in the UK where they have entire clinics of using ACT, basically in every or OT, PT, et cetera, they're all, all ACT all the time. There was a recent study with a three-year follow-up showing about 80% of gains in the, they had an inpatient program there, was maintained over three years. Uh, which is pretty good because a lot of those folks get disability payments, et cetera. You kind of have an investment in not getting better, and sort of like the VA and other places where we where we've done that, um, Scandinavia, et cetera, where um, you know uh, tinnitus. You know the second highest rate of disability in the VA is for tinnitus. I mean, it, it, it's we, we build systems of care that almost encourage it, so that's encouraging. I'd say. Um, uh, I'd be cautiously optimistic. But now why would that be? I think because there are positive things that happen. One of the things that's critical about the values piece is that it isn't something off in the future that we're talking about. We're talking about a quality of the present. Um, and, and if you can get people sensitive to it, like, for, for example, it isn't just like, you know, having loving relationships in my life, it's behaving in ways that are loving towards yourself and others, as an example. I mean, that value comes up very commonly for people. If you can sensitize yourself to it, there's some pieces that are there day to day, or moment to moment throughout your day. You know, if just taking the time to listen to a friend or to, even to a stranger coming up, you know, having the compassion to sort of understand their discomfort of approaching you or whatever the issue is, you can put that into your day. So I think it might be sustainable in if, if we can help people connect with the things that maintain behavior, which is get a good selection criteria and then get sensitivity to when those properties are present and then allow the system to evolve. Then if we can put that into the culture, instead of the toxic stuff we got in the culture now where we actively train our children to be avoidant, for example, you know, maybe we can build this in ways. And by the way, just on terms of these evolutionary streams, when you do this, I mean, there's a recent study uh, done, for example, with mindfulness meditation. You know, the epigenetic impact is gigantic. There's several hundred genes that get turned on and off over an eight-week period, all many, many of which involved in the stress responses and so forth, simply by something like meditation. So there may even be an underlying kind of uh, uh, material causality and. Uh, you know, how we're engaging uh, biological systems to support our, uh, behavior. If I could just add to that quickly, uh, this is part of the what's, what's interesting about thinking about culture as an evolutionary process. It goes without saying when we're thinking about genetic evolution that a genetic change, such as a mutation or some sort of gene therapy, is going to change the phenotype and change it permanently. So if you take cultural evolution seriously, it means that a single metaphorical change and the way, change that we're, the way we think can change the phenotype permanently. Yeah. So if there's a symbotype that's like a genotype, and if you can change the symbotype, and even if it takes an hour, if that's a permanent change, then we should expect a permanent change in the phenotype. There's no reason why it should go away. One thing I was going to show if I had time is an animation that we're using where we, have, we ask people to think of their life like driving a bus and passengers get on, some of the passengers you don't like, but if you're gonna stop and try to throw them off, you have to stop, plus they don't like leaving, plus meanwhile, you don't, you're not watching the road and you're not going anywhere. Well, you know, there's a lot of evidence that the flexibility that can come from metaphorical thinking because of its ability to apply to many, many things can have profound effects. Just being able to think metaphorically and creatively uh, uh, influences a cognitive and a flexibility. So we may be able to create some symbotypes that are inherently more flexible and to do that quickly. And uh, we've been actively trying to pursue that in some of the therapy work we're doing by giving people you know, kind of healthier metaphors. Somebody in here was talking about the metaphors that are involved in th thinking about evolution. Some are, you know, like, can be more helpful and not helpful or thinking about disease in the same way people think about their own process, processes. And some of those is, is, 
as David was saying, I think could have very long-term uh, effects so that the next time a passenger shows up that you don't like, it's kind of like, well, I guess Joe's taken a ride for me lately and not like, everything has to stop, I'm feeling sad, or everything has to stop, I'm feeling anxious. You know, maybe there's other things you could do and the metaphor might support that. I was very, very excited by Stephen's talk and by the general approach. And let me just say a little bit about why I was so excited. My name is Bill Durham. I teach in human biology and anthropology here at Stanford. And for many years, I've been fascinated by the notion that there are two evolutionary streams of extra importance for humanity. One's the genetic evolutionary stream, and the other is the cultural, the, the, the non genetically transmitted, socially transmitted information stream that is so important to our lives and to our behaviors. And um, an avid Darwinist, I've always appreciated Darwin's attention to variation and selection and inheritance. And so I asked myself, well, are there cultural equivalents? And I eventually persuaded myself that value-driven decision-making, a very simple thing we do every day. In fact, it was Darwin's original metaphor, value-driven decision-making, was the reason he called the thing natural selection. It was called human selection before Darwin, the, the impact that human breeders had on the animal populations. Darwin said, I'm going to call it natural selection so that people understand what I'm talking about, and so made a metaphor in nature for a value-driven decision process. So I basically argued that a value-driven decision process is the main but not exclusive means for evolutionary change in the cultural information stream, and that sets up a very interesting interaction because the kinds of things that we pick with our values, culturally inherited and culturally shared, are very different from the kinds of things that emerge as a reproductive advantage uh, through survival and reproduction in nature. So you end up with all kinds of interesting comparisons, tensions between culture and genetics. Well, it occurred to me that if, if this idea were correct, there ought to be pathologies in the decision system that would be very interesting to study when it breaks down when it doesn't work right. And my way of hearing Stephen's talk was that he outlined, he, he answered my dream of looking at what breaks down. He said we have an emotional avoidance detour, that one of the pathologies of the decision mechanism is you get so hung up on feeling good, you don't stop to evaluate uh, you know, using your emotional equipment, that the emotional set of values are stripped away from you, you, you simply are on an emotional avoidance detour. Secondly, cognitive entanglement, that we follow rules without stopping to think, without sitting with our feelings and sitting with the situation. We try to follow rules for an easy solution. If you do both of these, you're going to negate the whole beauty of a value-driven decision system. You're going to have pathologies of behavior or something that should have evolved to promote a adaptive behavior, or at least to promote you know, a wise process of cultural, a value-driven process of cultural ev evolution, a mindful process of cultural evolution. Now, I grant you, I was all hung up. Uh, mindfulness was something I really built into this whole argument that it would require a lot of mindfulness. People would have to recognize that there are options, that they can exert a choice, at least in certain circumstances that they can talk about their values and use those values to make a choice among options and that we could have selective retention of variation in a cultural system through a mindful process. What's so fabulous is that Stephen is talking about, from the point of view of a clinical psychologist, what goes wrong with this system, at least this is what I hear, you know, what, goes, what can go wrong with this system in a world that's just, you know, where, where we've lost track and where we've just gotten bombarded by stimuli, how this system can get off track, and instead of giving us cultural evolution of an interesting, dynamic kind, it can get us all off the track, and the only way you can get back to it is by making people be mindful again. Yep. I just thought that was so exciting to me because it was like the test you would want of an argument that cultural evolution is driven by value-guided selective attention. This uh, same basic kind of formula is kind of a simple formula, although my work started in the clinic and has gone here to behavioral health domain, has, and it's, it fits with what you're saying, gone into education organizations and things of that kind. Uh, for example, Frank Bond, who's at the University of London, the dean of the School of Management or Business or something or other, who's, who's an ACT guy 
has shown that if you bring these concepts into management training, you get more satisfied but also more productive workers, but only if you give them the environments in which they can apply their psychological flexibility skills so that you can teach them and learn. So it's not a trait. It's something that you can actually, in the sense that it's fixed, you can actually you know, train it, but it also requires an environment to support it. And he has a randomized trial done with a stock brokerage, for example, where the stock brokers start selling a hell of a lot more stocks and having family day at work and bringing their kids to hang out with them. You know, that, that somehow or another we've created a culture in which, it, you know, this kind of values-based decision-making sometimes is pushed to the side and we get focused just on the bottom line. It even interferes on the bottom line. We can do better by uh, creating environments that will support people and being more f flexible and creative and values-based in what they're doing. And that's not just the clinic. That's uh, now uh, questions from the audience. Uh, so my question is, why is it that we have sort of this window of influence from this kind of I incoming information that allows us to get so off track? Do you see that as a byproduct of sort of being evolved to take in cultural information and uh, alter our behavior because of that? Or do you see it as a byproduct of the way the, you know, our wiring is in terms of dopamine and serotonin function? Uh, and are you refer referring to the, this open, you mean the way in which uh, cognition can dominate uh, over our, our lives moments uh, and this sort of subtext is agenda of feeling good and not thinking, uh, you know, I think part of this is that it's a discrimination problem. It's so massively useful and so m such a large part of our lives and culturally in such a large part of the life of the culture that it's just running on autopilot. It's just, a, oh, it's overextended. It's going, it's kind of going every, everywhere to the point of harming us. And I think we need to be able to kind of learn our, how to have our cake and eat it too by being able to put our mind on a leash. We have to be able to fi find ways to use logical, judgmental, analytical mode of thinking, problem-solving mode of thinking, and also to have it available, appreciation mode of thinking, the kind of the thing that you'd bring to a sunset. You don't, you know, you're going to appreciate a sunset, you're not going to do it by, you know, a little more pink would be nice, God, and that blue is a little bit off. You know, and so without that capacity for appreciation, observation, et cetera, things like peace of mind, purpose, love, connection are more difficult. And so I think we've overfed this judgmental, analytical mode of mind, but we don't, but we would dare not, uh, not use it. We just need to put it on a leash and be able to use it instead of having it use us. One thing we know about evolution is that it doesn't always lead to adaptive outcomes. There's more to evolution than adaptation. And what's adaptive in an evolutionary sense is not necessarily adaptive in the sense of human uh, welfare. So all of these things. And also, uh, an evolutionary process that evolved by genetic evolution only works well on average. And so we actually expect a proportion of cases in which there are dysfunctional outcomes, and that's what we see. So. Uh, yeah. If I could just say 30 seconds, one of the nice things about the, having a basic science underneath this, which I didn't expose you to, but the relational frame theory work can be used when you want to build language functions. Values is an example, but we've also used methods, for example, to establish sense of self in kids that don't have it, to increase the intellectual performance of children. We can raise kids' IQs. It's being used to promote reading, problem solving, etc. So by understanding the processes, you can do the analytical part and actually do it better, but also uh, uh, learn how to and teach kids how to back out of that and, and to use this more intuitive and experiential part of us. Please. Hi, thank you. I'm Leslie Alesco from UC Berkeley and the Department of Integrative Biology. I'm thinking about what you talked about from a um, multi multicultural perspective. A lot of basically all your studies, as I understood it, are from Western cultures. Yes. Um, so, have you ever looked at other cultures or? That kind of leads to the bigger question is, do you think that some cultures or some religions might actually be more adaptive in this terms of psychological health? Almost Should certainly the answer to that second one must be, must be true. We do know, for example, that when you've been Western ideas of mental health, for example, into cultures, it great, does great damage. And people become much more disturbed. They get, you know, because you no longer have a place for abnormality that used to, uh, used to be there, for example, things of that kind. But uh, we've, we've done a number of cross-cultural studies. For example, this experiential avoidance piece relates to health outcomes the same in uh, Buddhists in Japan as it does to uh, evangelicals in the U.S. Uh, you know, so we've, 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 it's a, there's a worldwide, worldwide group. There's more people in doing this kind of work outside of the U.S. than inside the U.S., and including in Africa and many places where 
uh, Western science hasn't been really uh, strong because we're dealing with basic language processes, but is culture important in these other ways? Yes, I'll give you an example. Um, uh, the Japanese language doesn't do I, you in the same way. It's closer to we, they, or more dominant. And you can show the development of sense of self, which is underneath the mindfulness work. I didn't show you any of the studies we've done around that, are different in terms of how people get into uh, acceptance and compassion, which is, I also didn't present that either, but, uh, the details matter and the culture matters, but the big picture, if the analysis is right, like what a symbol is, what a word is, uh, what language is, and how these basic processes of learning, and basic processes of learning, I don't think it's a, a cultural issue, 520 million years old, you know, it's not, uh, seem still to apply, it's just that the details have to be changed. Just so in broad that. strokes, that applies. To, just to reinforce the point, I think the cultural evolution literature shows for many, many, a majority of non-Western societies the utility of a value-based decision system for understanding cultural outcomes and cultural change through time. It's worked for, you know, incest prohibition in the new era. It's worked for Tibetan marriage system patterns. It's worked all over the world. And so I think you can, um, again, even when it's working in yeah, a positive, nice. in, a, in, a, in a normal functionality, you can see it in a multicultural context. Okay, well, this is great, and thank you so much. Uh, we have another great session right uh, following upon this, so let's have a... <laughs>